welcome to episode 188 of the Access Noise podcast. I'm Mark Miller. Thanks for listening. In this episode, I speak to Hi-Fi Sean, one half of Hi-Fi Sean and David McAlmond, about their new album, Daylight. If you missed the previous episode, I spoke to Dougie Payne from Travis about their new album, LA Times. So check it out, and if you like the podcast, Please subscribe in your favourite listening platform, give us a rating, and leave a comment. With an impressive roster of past collaborations such as Yugo Ono, Crystal Waters and Bootsy Collins, Hi-Fi Sean teams up with David McCormand to create a unique palette of alternative electronica. Their new album Daylight is an exhilarating suite of 12 songs which celebrates, expresses and explores the colours of summer. In this interview, Hi-Fi Sean talks about how he started the band with David, the writing and recording of the new album, and lots more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Hi-Fi Sean. So, hi Sean, welcome to the Access Noise podcast. Uh, Hi there, how you doing? Very good. I like to go back to the start. Can you remember the first band or artist that made you pay attention to music? Um, wow, I can like I always tell a story where I grew up in Bell Hill, which is just outside Glasgow. Uh, my local barber was also a record shop, so my dad used to buy me records to get my hair cut. So they bought me a little record player, and they worked out if they buy me records every time I went get my hair cut, I'd get a record. So <laughs> I, I, I'd like to be having short hair. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I, I had a lot of records, but were obviously their musical tastes that I grew up with, you know. And one of the first records I remember is Get It On by T-Rex. And I'm a huge T-Rex fan, so they made the right choice there. Yeah, great band, great band. Yeah, my dad always played T-Rex in the house growing up, so that's how I know them. Great thing about T Rex that not a lot of people uh, give them credit for is how you know how they laid down really solid grooves. I mean, they're great mm-hmm. dance records. Get it on, it's just got this backbeat that just keeps going, you know. So, you know, I love I mean, I suppose that's kind of influenced what I do. I love things with a great backbeat and a great solid groove all the way through. So yeah, T Rex T Rex were funky to my five year old ears. Yourself and David McGomond are going to put out your second album in August, Daylight. What was the initial spark that led to your collaboration? How did you both meet and decide to work together? So about six or seven years ago, I made an album called FT, which stands for Featuring. A lot of people ask me sometimes, what does it stand for? And it's like, it's obvious what it stands for. <laughs> somebody, somebody actually asked me once, why did you call your album Financial Times? And I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I made this album with FT because I hadn't made an album for about 15 years, cut a long story short. So the concept I had was I didn't have much confidence in myself. And I thought, what if I work with somebody else on every track? Different people. And um, there's people like, uh, you know, uh, Crystal Waters, we done Testify, and um, Yoko Ono and Fred from the B-52s. But one of those people were David. Um, and I was just looking, I was looking from my record collection, trying to think of people who were unique to themselves and unlike anybody else. And the album's made up of people like that, like, you know, Alan Vega and Billy Ray Martin, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, so David came up, the idea of David came up. I'd never met David before. Uh, the first time we met was the day he recorded that vocal on the track in Brixton, where he lives. And we became friends, basically. We ended up hanging out after that initial meeting. It wasn't just like, right, bang, here's a, here's a track, bye. But we just ended up hanging out. He was coming to my DJ gigs. I was going to his kind of uh, his shows and... And I ended up, we started recording some songs just out of fun um, through kind of drunken conversations about Prince productions and things. We ended up recording some songs in my my little home studio and um, we realised that we were really enjoying that. And then I was like, do you know something? We've got two tracks that are really good. If we made another 10, we would have an album. And he said, what are you asking me? Do you want to make an album? I went, yeah, let's make an album. And he said, okay. And... 
that's how Hi-Fi Sean and David McCallum started, which is kind of nice because it's kind of the way when you're really young, how you start a band, you hang out with friends, you talk about music and you end up being in a band. So it was the exact same thing, which was lovely. It wasn't like a, it wasn't a contract on paper. Hey, let's, you know, let's do this. It was more just, it was completely bred through friendship. Yeah, and that album was Happy Ending, your your debut album, and there was a fantastic reaction to that album. So so how did that feel? Happy Ending was um, recorded over a few years because we, you know, like like you do when you start a band, you, you know, with a band you go in a room and you, you jam and you eventually get your sound. So with us, it was an idea of we'll just keep recording until we eventually have stuff that sounds like we have a sound, you know, because we were experimenting in different angles and things. And then we started to realise now this is now starting to sound like a body of work. This is what we are about. And... Um, the Bollywood Orchestra was from myself because I had already worked with Chandra back in the late 90s, uh, who's an amazing Bollywood string arranger in Bangalore. And, and I met up with him and said, do you want to do this again? And he said, I'd love to. And um, he'd done an, a completely stunning job on the tracks that he conducted. But it was all it was all very low key, and it was all made in my studio and mixed in my studio. There was no engineers involved. I mixed it, I recorded it, I engineered it. Um, so we're we're really proud of that album because it, it sounds it sounds very expensive. <laughs> it was very expensive. <laughs> like I always tell people, it was a posh album. That's a posh album. Happy ending. So what's the process, what's the songwriting process between your, yourself and David? Do you put the music together and then does David come up with lyrics? How does it work? You know, it kind of works in both ways. We've had things where we've been in the room together and come up with ideas and start jamming on ideas. But more more recently, we've started doing this thing. We've found a kind of way that we work that I will come up with some music at my space and I send it over to David in his space and he starts working on ideas and then he sends it back and we just send it backwards and forwards until we we find uh you know like a kind of place where we both meet and then we get together in the studio and take it from there and David's voice it's just such an amazing voice and, and with your music it's just you know it's, it's fantastic the thing about the thing about David is it's like people are always going about his voice the thing that people don't realize is David's also an incredible lyricist you know yeah, it's, yeah. It's, just about, and I've always said this, to have a great voice, there's lots and lots of people out there that have great voices, but to have a great voice and a great mind at the same time, and a great mind that knows how to use that voice, that's when you get something special. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And th in August, August 16th, you, you released the follow-up, uh, Daylight, the follow-up to Happy Ending. Yeah, so Wait. Daylight, honestly, the concept of Daylight is it's actually two albums. There's going to be an album called Twilight, so there's Daylight, in the summer and twilight in the winter and kind of obvious by the titles where we're going with that um one's one's all about euphoria sunshine ecstasy kind of the vitamin d rush of of sun which is there's not that much of at the moment <laughs> um, which is kind of ironic because the, the next single is called sun come up which is a plea for sun which is a plea for like sun worship. Um, and then Twilight, which we've just finished, is stunning. It's turned out absolutely amazing. Twilight is um, much more of a late night album, songs about solitude, darkness. Um, and that album will be out on Valentine's Day. February 14th, because we uh, we think it's an album for late late night lovers. Yeah, I look forward to that there, but I've been really loving uh, Daylight. You know, as you said, it's, it's euphoric, so uplifting, you know, it, may, it puts a smile on yeah. the face. So let's 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 talk about some of the tracks. Um, you, you mentioned Song Come Up, uh, which is going to be the next single. I read on your Facebook, you said it's the best record you've ever released. Yeah, I think it's the best record we've released yet, myself and David. I think it's uh, it's kind of the point where we've made a record which has everything we ever wanted out of this collaboration or project, whatever you want to call it. I call it a band. I hate it when there's only two people in something. They always call it a project or a collaboration. It's not, it's a band. We're a band. It's just like, you know, Yazoo are a band, you know. It's like, Catch up, boys. We're a band. So it's like, Razor. I think the problem with us is because we're known as separate artists. So when artists get together, they go collaboration or 
project, but now we're a band. Um, we just couldn't think of a band name. That was a problem. <laughs> we caught up with someone that were dreadful. Uh, it's really hard when you're this age to think of a band name. When you're 18, you don't care. You know, I mean, the Soup Dragons is not exactly the deepest name. So it's yeah. like, like when you're older, you're like everything you come up with. You think, oh God, no, oh God, no. You, you, you pick it. But daylight, yeah, daylight. Um, sun come up. Um, is is basically a cry for sun worship. Uh, slightly kind of. I mean, you, you'll see the video. The video is like a bit wicker man meets altered states. It's a bit of a pagan sun worship video. Which is kind of ironic because when we were making this album, it was like, it's either going to be a really, really sunny summer or it's going to be a really bad summer because that's kind of how it goes, isn't it? And yeah. so far, it's not been that good, has it? So um, to have an album which celebrates sunshine and daylight uh, is kind of cool in our books because we kind of made it in a way that it could work both ways. So, um, you know, Sun Come Up is basically a plea for sunshine. Um, my favorite song on the album is USB USC, where David recites his holiday packing list. Yeah, because it came from a joke that somebody once said to David he could sing his shopping list, and, um, <laughs> and it would be good. And it wasn't me who said that; it was somebody else. I think I said that. So David, when I sent him the track, he was about to go on holiday to Italy, and he had a list he'd all written out previously of all the stuff he had to take, and he just sang it. He basically just sang every item on the list. And I remember when the day, because how it works sometimes is he'll phone me up and sing me an idea of a song down the phone with the music playing in the background. And I was kind of listening to it thinking, this is completely insane. And I didn't expect this at all. But it's also genius because of that. It's the shock factor of realising that halfway through the song, you're actually just listening to a list of, like a shopping list of or, or a, it's basically not a shopping list. It's a it's a packing list of things to yeah. remind them to pack. So uh, and it's a song about um, you know, it's USB to USC. It's just one of the most crazy titles I've ever been in <laughs> in all the years I've been making records. So at this at this late day of the game, I am quite proud to have a song called USB USC. Yeah, it's certainly different, you know, and it doesn't matter, you know, what he's saying really, because some people don't even listen to words, but it sounds class. Yeah, I mean, the core, it's funny, we went on tour last year and we played a lot of the songs from Daylight, which was quite hard because we were supposed to be promoting a happy ending, but we were so happy about these new ones. So we, there was about 30% happy ending and percent Daylight. But the new stuff went down better. And USB, right. was, every night people were like, oh my God, that song, USB. Is amazing, and we were like really shocked. We were thinking this could go either two ways with this song, you know, because it's so kind of bonkers in a way that people are either going to see it as being this or this, and no, people, people just get it straight away. I think they love the fact that it's, you know, it's slightly tongue in cheek, and and it's and it's a great tune. It's got it's got a great hook, you know. It's it's a fun track, which is. Uh, I think from the last album, Happy Ending, um, which is slightly a darker album, um, it was nice to have something like this on Daylight. Golden Hour, what can you tell me about that? Golden Hour um, is uh, lyrically, what can I tell you? Well, I th it's, it's a love song. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heartfelt love song. There's a lot of really heartfelt love songs. David is an incredible love song lyricist. Um, Goldener is actually it's quite ironic because like the, the the keyboard drift that goes all the way through the song that uh, uh, that da -da, da -da. I found an MP3 like I was going through tons and tons of old hard drives once and I found this MP3 that was just me playing that riff from like I'm talking about 12, 14 years ago and I'm just like mm -hmm. and I was like <laughs> remember this riff and I was like oh my god that's amazing and then I resurrected it and turned it into Goldener. Yeah, it's a great track, and and then uh, one of my other favorites, "Celebrate." I love David. David sings. My instinct for survival is to celebrate. Yeah, it's a great. That's a classic. That's a classic. Uh, I mean, it's like when he said that to me, I was just like, "That's just a classic chorus." It's yeah. kind of sums up about how we all feel, and and you know, if there's any if any if there's any person in this world that stands by that title, it's him because he does. You know, his, his instinct to survival is for him to celebrate.
What track on the album means the most to you? So this is the thing. I started running last year because uh, I was feeling a bit bluesy and down and all this. And it was kind of towards the end of the, the whole lockdown thing. And I, I I run 5K three times a week now, which is insane. I couldn't even run for a bus like a few, like last year. But that's how I listen to music. And that's how I listen to music when I'm writing the music and when I'm mixing it, I listen to the mixes. Because when you're running, your head's in a kind of different space than sitting in front of speakers. So I've started listening to, as you know, the last few months I've been working on Twilight. So I've been concentrating on that. But I went back to listening to Daylight, um, the last few runs I did. And it was just amazing how, how it was really refreshing to go back to it with different ears and the one that i fell in love with was meantime um with a ding 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 ding. it's got kind of real bass and guitar and things i love meantime um i remember when we first wrote that one and david just sang the whole thing in falsetto it was like um it, it, it's, it's slightly everything I love about music. It's got that kind of r romantic, warm feel, but it's got this real pop energy and a great groove. So um, I'm cl I'm kind of like camp meantime at the moment, and I'm also a big lover of um, the track Coalition, which is yes, yeah. I think that's the th third track in the album. The third track in the album Coalition is great. Funny you mentioned running. I run every day as well. Um, and it's usually about 5k or maybe four, five, four miles, five miles. Right. But I've had the album on running and it's amazing. It just really it's a great keeps you. Album, isn't it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I'm, sure, I'm always undecided every time I go for it. I spend more time getting, uh, picking what I'm going to listen to for, for my run than, than getting yes. ready. And uh, I've been sticking it on on the SoundCloud link and it's just. You just go, you know, you're, you don't want to say anyway, you, when, when you're out running, you just go on the, your mind goes different places, but it really helps you along, you know, just the, the music. And here, here's a funny thing that I only ever noticed until recently that, you know, because most of the albums we've made or I've made over the years are all 40 minutes long, because usually with vinyl, um, you have to have about between 20 to 25 minutes a side. So most four, four, five K runs are 40 minutes. Yeah. Like kind of like, so by the time you get to the 12th track, the run's finished and you're just great. It's just like, it's the perfect running album. You know, like it's 40, I think it's 41 minutes long and it just fits exactly. You know? Perfect. So it was designed for runners. It was, it's, it's got a right, because it has got a right kind of like, you know that thing when you run the first, uh, you know, that for me personally, but I've heard other people say this, the first five minutes are the hardest for me. Yes. Because it's that bit where you think like, Oh, I'm tired today. I'm going to give up, or you know, it's that point where you have to get over that, and then you're okay because then you get set into a rhythm and yep. you don't feel pain anymore. And the album kicks in because Daylight's got that slow kind of intro track, but then the album starts picking up pace, and it feels like it's it's, it's it is a great running album. It should be sponsored by Nike. <laughs> <laughs> no, it definitely is, and 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 the album finishes on on a high with the Belter track, of the show, which. Sure, show, yeah. And it really kicks in at one one minute 20, and, you know, it's an amazing moment. You know, I would love to hear it live, but when I've been listening to that running, I keep, if it's the last song and I'm still out for a bit longer, I keep on going back to it. I've listened to it, there's one, one run I've listened to it about three times, because when that kicks in at one twenty, it's just amazing. It just gets the heart going. So you must run faster than me, because I only kicks in at 40 minutes for me, so it's like... I like, I get to like, I guess, according to my app that I run with, I'm seven... Is it seven point two or something? I run or something. The speed or something. So it's like, uh, yeah, it seems to be that album finishes exact finishes. And the weird the thing as well, you've heard the album. So and people who hopefully have heard the album by the time maybe they listen to this is um, we come up with this idea of having this young child sinks to say you know from daylight because i had this joke about from daylight becomes twilight twilight becomes daylight daylight becomes twilight and i love the idea of making the album conceptual that when you finish one of the albums it goes into the next album and then when you get to the end of that one you go back to the other one so you'll hear it when you hear twilight eventually so twilight starts the same but it's all the way around from daylight turns twilight and then it, it all kind of like there's a there's a there's a conceptual side to the album that hopefully one day when we're dead and gone, people will be talking about it like Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. So yeah, you've got the your your euphoria of daylight, and then the nocturnal album Twilight. If you just you just just want to twenty older album, it's a kind of like it's just a it's a day in the life. Yeah, and is Twilight finished? 
Twilight's completely finished. It's mastered and everything. It's uh, I did, I did, I can't run eighty minutes. I was going to try. I was just like, I wonder if I could run eighty minutes and listen to both. But I listened to Twilight the other day running, which is great because it's exactly forty minutes again. <laughs> and the weird thing is, I kind of thought this is going to be hard to run to because it's you know it's quite a down album. Yeah. It's not because it's really submersive. And um, uh, the few people that I've heard it have said the same thing. They're all like, "Oh my god, the album's so." you just get lost in this world that you've created. And I, I do feel Twilight, we've created a world which is very different to Daylight, but they do sound like the, you know, they're the same thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, I can't wait to hear it. You'll be doing some live shows in November, so what, what can we expect from the live shows and, and how do you approach live performances together? So in November, we, um, I mean, we're actually doing a show at uh, Jack White out the White Stripes place in London, the third man. We're doing that the night before daylight comes out because we did that before Happy Ending. We played the night before Happy Ending came out at that venue. It's a great venue. Um, the last time we sold it out in four hours and this time we sold it out in an hour, which is insane. So, um, I mean, it's not the biggest venue, so it doesn't, we haven't sold out Madison Square Gardens, but we sold out. One of our favourite venues in London, and uh, the people that work there are amazing. The sound in the venue is stunning. It's, it's got all these little speakers along there. It's just it's just a great place. So um, yeah, in November we go on tour, uh, playing Glasgow, Leeds, Birmingham, Manchester, uh, Brighton, and London. But you know, it's crazy to think we've only really been around for two years, but now we've got thirty six songs to choose from playing live, which is insane. You know, because most live sets are like 12 to 14 songs. So it's, it's going to be pretty tricky in, in November to, to work out what, what to play. So uh, it's nice being in that position. But yeah, wow, well, we've got, you know, not many people in the, you know, because it's like in, in two years we would have released three albums, which is quite an insane place to be in. What ambitions do you have going forward for the band? Um... Well, we've already realised that we have about half another album from tracks that we've recorded over the last two years that we, you know, because kind of what you kind of do, I suppose, you you make something, you think, oh, this doesn't fit with us, so you put it aside. Um, I've started realising we've got all these great things that um, we need to work on. So, and, you know, David was in St. Lucia uh, a few months ago, uh, visiting his family and his nephew, who's a rapper, uh, done a track with them that we'd made. So we've got that as well, which is really exciting. It's a track called Orange Sunshine. With, uh, and it, and it kind of opened up a new chapter because we kinda, we'd kind of like to do more of this work with people that do rhyming. So we've got, we've got some ideas about where to take this. Do you have anybody in mind? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> well, I'd like to do some more with his with his nephew because he's great. He's called Soul TK. Um but um, yeah, we'd like we'd, it's something we kind of sit down and start uh, doing a bit of research about, you know. So if anybody's got any ideas, bring them forward. We can't not mention the Super Dragons. In 1990, you released "I'm Free," you know, which was everywhere, and it's still a great track now. Um, what do you remember about that track? Um, you know, and about that time. What I remember about that track is coming back from a, you know, like from some kind of late night party at four o'clock in the morning, turning the television on uh, BBC Two. I remember it so well. Uh, the Stones at Hyde Park in the 60s was on, uh, which was one of the few times they played I Am Free. And because uh, it was for, it was for Brian and they played I Am Free and um, it just stuck in my head. I'd never heard the record before. I never had a copy of the record, and a few weeks later we were in the studio and I just made it up. You know, it was completely made out of memory. That's why it's so radically different, because I couldn't remember how the music went. Couldn't really remember how uh, the lyrics are. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and it was, kind of, it was kind of strange to think that a record that had the least amount of effort in making became the biggest thing that I've ever been involved in. I remember it just being in constant rotation on MTV. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was a great video as well. The video was yeah. very, the video was very based on. Um, I mean, I was always very forward thinking. I liked psychedelia, but I was I got really into working with people who were inventing new ways of visuals that created were were created with computers and technology at the time. In the same way, we were like messing about with technology, making the records, and. Um, 
I worked like if you ever remember the Love God, the cover, which is fractals. We were one of the first people to use that imagery on videos because we actually worked with the guy who invented that whole situation, which was a guy called Doctor uh, Mandelbrot, and he would give us imagery to use in our record covers and in the the, um, the music videos. Now, if David was here, one of my questions. This next question was be if, would be if you could pick a song you enjoy from each other's other previous projects what would you choose he's obviously not here so i've got if to you could, <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you could pick his i know that did, well, i know what you might say about me uh because i know he's a big fan of testify the record i made with crystal waters um i have brilliant track and it's actually one of my favorite records as well that i've made it's what i just have so many good memories making that record and once again it was a record that took very little effort to make it just made itself it's weird that it's mm -hmm. just like it's kind of like that i'm free thing you know i think sometimes when you don't get too obsessive about something it becomes something it just grows itself so um yeah i, I got a funny feeling david i said testify um me with him um i really love the mccallum butler song falling i think falling is also a wonderful production and wonderful song and i didn't really know it that much until i saw mccallum and butler were playing a good few years ago and uh, david invited me along and i went along and they played that song live and it just completely blew me away so uh, that's that's my choice of his catalog i like to ask my guests the following questions for us music fans music is the soundtrack to our memories what song or album when you listen to it brings back the best memories for you um, once again, Get It On by T-Rex because it's, it's, it's a song that I've got lots of memories from from different periods of my life. Um, and one of them being was um, the band I was in after the Soup Dragons, The High Fidelity. Uh, we worked with Mickey Finn from T-Rex. Mm -hmm. He played percussion on our album and became good friends. And he passed away. Um, and at that time, I was DJing at Glasgow Art School. And... When he it was it, he um it was a few months before he passed away when he knew he was ill he gave me through a friend of a kind of joint friend he gave me his copy of Get It On because he knew I was such a huge fan and it was he told me it was one of the first ones off the pressing with you know Mark yeah. got Mickey got one and um and the night he passed away we played that record at the club and it was just a really beautiful moment so uh, yeah I think I think. It's it's kind of weird when people say, "What's your favorite record?" I think you you have favorites from different periods of your life, but that's always been one of the the ones that's always been there. So that's why now I just reference that record. It's like there's no point in me trying to think of all our stuff because it's been there all my life. It's just it's just every time I hear it, it's still on the radio. If I'm in the car, and it comes on the radio. It's just like, geez, I mean, how can you not love this record? You know, anybody that doesn't like get it on. I would be very, very wary of. And there must be something seriously dodgy about them. Because I don't know anybody who does not like get it on. Show me a man that doesn't like get it on, and I will have a word with them. You know something you've made after this. I'm going to listen to T Rex. I'm going to put some T Rex on. <laughs> Good man. You put me in the mood. The, slider. the slider's my favourite album. By T Rex, I love the slider. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm a best of the T Rex, sir. That's that's all I have. Like, but it's going you should, on. You after should this. check out the movie Born to Boogie, the movie that um, that uh, Ringo Starr made. There's this amazing section in the middle where you'll find it on YouTube as well. This clip where uh, Mickey and Mark are sitting with nuns around them eating hamburgers. You know, as you do, <laughs> and um, they do a few acoustic songs just with a string section and then playing good, you know, Mickey's playing bongos and I think, no, no, Mickey's eating a hamburger, but Mark's just playing his acoustic guitar and it is the most beautiful 15 minutes ever. You have to check it out. So I just, they think they do, um, I think they do the slider as one of the songs and it's just gorgeous. No, well, I definitely will. I will, I will do, thanks. Thanks for the recommendation. Um, last one. Okay. If you could go back and relive one musical moment from your career, what would it be? Wow. Um, I don't want to sound big-headed or whatever, but we, 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 did, we did a tour in the 90s with NXS, which was in huge, crazy like venues. But we played two nights at Madison Square Gardens. And I think I would really like, like to relive that first night because it just felt otherworldly the fact that we were on stage in madison square gardens and you go backstage and um you know 
um, Alice Cooper comes to meet you and things just jump in the door. Alice Cooper would like to say hello, you know, that just that insanity of that crazy world that you've just stepped into. So, um, to me, that's one of the most. I mean, and another one that's on that same tour, we played in uh, New Jersey in a, this huge, you know, basketball arena. And the people started to sing I'm Free so loud that we couldn't hear ourselves playing. We, and it was that kind of typical Beatles thing where you had to stop because you couldn't actually play anymore. We couldn't hear ourselves. And it was, there was like 30,000 people singing I'm Free at the top of their voices. Wow, wow. Must have been amazing. And then Excess, you're one of my favorite bands. Fantastic. Yeah, Michael. Michael was honestly one of the most lovely men that I've ever met in the music industry. I, I, I easily hands down. He was, he was always so um, interested in what you were doing more than what he was doing, and that's what I, I think I learned that from him quite quick. That's the best way to be in life. They were all really nice guys. It was a, it was a really lovely thing to be in your early twenties. You know, traveling all over America with this humongous. I mean, we were only supposed to play two shows. No, it was one show, sorry, one show in Florida. And um, Michael had watched us from the side of the stage and came backstage afterwards and said, um, We would like you to do the whole tour. And, and I was like, We're only supposed to be in America for two days. So we don't have any luggage. We just came over, you know, we any. And he went away. It's a true story. He went away and came back with a blank check, gave us a blank check and says, buy anything you want, come on tour with us, buy clothes, buy whatever, come on tour with us. And um wow. go shopping and buy clothes. Because we literally had like two t shirts and a pair of jeans because we were only there for a few days. So uh, we ended up being on the road for about two to three months with them. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, Sean, that, that's me, John. Is there anything you'd like to mention before we wrap up? Can you do you want to tell people where they can get the album? So Daylight, Daylight's, you know, it's all in record shops, it's on Bandcamp, my label, it's on my label Plastique Recordings, which I've been running since the late 90s, but it's, yeah, it's everywhere, and check out the video uh, for Sun Come Up, uh, and I think we're making a video for USB, USC, which is going to be quite fun because we we work with, the, the guy that works, does all our visuals is a guy called Arbor that we've worked with from Happy Ending from the start. He does everything. He does all the artworks and stuff with us. And um, he's got a lot of old 80s video equipment, like proper antique video equipment. And he said, it would be really fun just to make the video completely with this equipment. Nothing, nothing since about, you know, nothing, you know, post 90s almost. Let's just make a video of his old 80s video equipment. So that should be quite fun. Yeah, I look forward to that. Again, the album's absolutely fantastic. I'm loving it. Really am. Um, great running album. As you actually uh, the first person I've spoke to um, that's gave me a review because <laughs> it's kind of weird because I was I, I, I don't see it as being that different to Happy Ending, but it is a different album to Happy Ending. It's a much more it's much more of a rush of an album. Uh, yeah. and it's really nice talking to somebody that knows the previous album and you like this one too. So you've made me happy. <laughs> No, no. And I'm looking forward to hearing the next one. And hopefully you and David, again, as I said, can come back and we'll talk about that. Yes. Yeah, as I said, David apologises. He's really unwell at the moment. He's got food poisoning and been up all night. Not well at all. He, he, meant, he phoned me this morning. <laughs> he sounded like death. He was just like, oh, could you do this yourself? And I'm like, yeah, sure, sure. But obviously, you know, I'll give you the choice if you want to do it with both of us or not. But um, so you have to agree to do it. But we'll definitely, definitely next time we'll definitely do it together. One hundred. No problem. I look forward to it. I really enjoyed this one. So I really look forward to speaking about the the next album the next time. Thank you. Thank you. I'll get. It. I'll let you hear it soon. Yeah. You take care. Thanks for everything. Thank you. No problem, mate. Take it easy. See you later. Bye. Bye.